Nigeria is Africa's biggest economy has been battling dollar shortages that arose from previously low oil prices for oil and its main export and coronavirus related disruptions. It has put a multiple exchange rate system in place as the government seeks to avoid the embarrassment of a large Naira devaluation. Earlier this month, the Central Bank of Nigeria CBN at the launch of the 100 for 100 Policy for Production and Productivity PPP announced plans to unveil a new FX bidding regime to support Nigerian companies in need of forex, particularly those involved in local production and job creation. We will focus on the central bank's forex regime vis-a-vis -vis sale to deposit money banks and effect on the economy. Welcome to Business Insight and Plus TV Africa. I am Justin Akadonye. Now, adulterated petroleum product, Africa's dwindling GDP, telecoms plan strike against MTN, among others, rounded up the business Nigeria this week. Here are the highlights. The Petroleum Tank Car Drivers Branch of the Nigerian Union of Petroleum and Natural Gas Workers on Wednesday threatened to begin a sudden nationwide strike to protest the failure of the federal government to fix 21 selected highways based on agreements reached by stakeholders. Also, the drivers under the endorsement of Nupeng stated that they had discovered that senior government officials were currently diverting the 621 billion naira provided by the Nigerian National Petroleum Company Limited for the rehabilitation of the identified federal highways. <music> President of African Development Bank, AFDB, Dr. Akin Wumi Adeshina, has lamented the dwindling economic fortunes of the African continent which he said had a decline in its gross domestic product GDP by $165 billion in 2020. He noted with dismay that over 30 million jobs were lost, while 26 million persons fell into extreme poverty within the period. MTN Nigeria has disclosed it is yet to receive a notification of strike action from the private telecommunications and communications senior staff associations of Nigeria, which recently threatened to ground its activities if the union demands are not met. In an email statement titled Response to New Alleging Planned Industrial Action signed by Company Secretary Uto Upana, the company said MTN Nigeria Communications PLC has received multiple media inquiries about a communication purportedly circulated by Texan, which alleges plans for an industrial action intended to disrupt national communication services. The Central Bank of Nigeria, CBN, says its foreign exchange policies, especially the Naira for Dollar scheme has led to significant improvement in diaspora remittances into the country. The Apex Bank revealed that diaspora inflow into Nigeria increased from an average of $6 million weekly in December 2020 to an average of more than $100 million weekly by January 2022. This was disclosed by the CBN Governor Godwin Emefele while speaking at a special press briefing at the end of the Bankers' Committee meeting on Thursday, February 10, 2022, at the CBN headquarters in Abuja. <music> Investors committed about 3.36 trillion naira to federal government bonds between January and December 2021. According to an analysis of the FGN bond auction results available on the website of the Debt Management Office, bond oversubscriptions hit 1.61 trillion naira within the period under review, indicating the investors' strong appetite for FGN bonds.
Welcome back, those who are disposed of the United of Business in Nigeria for this week. Now, the CBN governor, Godwin Emifili, told reporters that the central bank will stop commercial banks from sourcing dollars for import from its reserves in 2022. A similar ban placed on exchange bureaus in July caused the Naira to tumble to record lows on the black market. However, the Apex Bank is now saying it has no immediate plans to ban sale of forex to bank. Now, joining us now to discuss this is an economist, Gospel Obele. Many thanks for joining us, Gospel, on the show. All right, uh, let's talk about uh, this uh, issue that has been on since yesterday with the central bank addressing uh, the governor, addressing the press conference saying that uh, from December it will stop sourcing uh, uh, or selling uh, you know, FX to commercial banks. But today we saw a bit of a, a retraction saying that the CBN has uh, no such plans. But let's talk about uh, the ideal situation. How should it really be? Should the banks, uh, the DMBs, commercial banks, go uh, cap in hand to the central bank to source for Forex each time their customers demand it? Yeah, so I, once again, thank you, Jay, for having me. Um, I think we grossly underestimate the impact of the foreign exchange crisis in Nigeria. Uh, first of all, we are not even generating anything close to enough. And secondly, and so we, meaning that the supply angle to that market is already disrupted, all right, by, by virtue of our streams of FS receipts, as it were. Then on the flip side of things, the demand is outrageously high. You know, looking at it from the formal numbers to the informal numbers and the likes. All right, so Nigerians are constantly in need. Right, so the, the conversation between CBN and uh, the banks currently stand within the context of the official market at least. All right, now if you, if you, if you spread that a bit externally to the context of the informal market, there is a big conversation around big period of change operators, you know, sourcing effects and making effects available for Nigerians who may not be able to, all right, source from banks and the like. So um, we need a relatively more sustainable approach to dealing with the core problem of FX shortage, all right? Until we can do with, deal with that, any other policies that the central bank is introducing, all right, will bounce back to, will come back to hurt the economy because the central bank is trying to manage FX flow. Not, not, not knowing that, I mean, when you have an outrageously high de market demand, all right, it's, 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 it looks like, it's gonna be like an aggressive move from the demand side stakeholders, meaning banks, bureau the change, and the end users, consumers and the likes, all right? It's going to be an aggressive move by those stakeholders to get the dollar at any cost. And when you go that route, you increase activities in the informal sector, exchange, the exchange rates may increase, all right? And there may be some receipts of informal um, foreign exchange, in a sense, that cannot be accounted for. So there's going to be a lot of pressure down the line if the CBN goes this route. But the CBN's context is quite justifiable. There's a strong FX challenge. And the CBN cannot solve that problem without the support and commitment from the fiscal body, which is the federal government of Nigeria. No, but specifically, over time, the CBN has had um, a lot of um, different um, policies, uh, you know, just to help uh, boost the... Uh, FX and of course demand for access by uh, by Nigerians and those who really have um, no genuine need from it. Uh, over time, we you are aware of what happened with the uh, Bureau of the Change Operators and that they've been banned, you know, from selling FX. But do you really think that in a way has actually uh, helped out in any way since uh, they were banned from selling FX? So many of the policies the central bank has introduced when it comes to FX management have been reactive rather than proactive proactive okay reactive i mean yeah reactive i mean you want to think about it this way you have an injury on your leg and then you are not treating that injury instead of treating the injury and using all the necessary medications you are just putting the plaster and the bandage hoping it will heal like that i mean you'll give them for infections and so and that's what's happening right now the central bank is in a fix and literally running out of options and uh, because you already have a supply challenge or is seeking to manage and control the demand flow all right so what we've seen that whole lot of policies over the years or over months certainly the last four years has been trying to reduce fx access to certain commodities trying to increase this trying to increase that trying to um shut this out trying to, all of those policies have been reacting and they've been patching the problem not necessarily solving the problem that's why every time we come back to this challenge and anytime we come back to this challenge, the foreign exchange rate suffers for it. And guess what? 
all right, every stakeholder, including the average Nigerian, suffers for it. So, until we go back to the basis of structural approach, all of the policies that the central bank has introduced, to be honest, none has worked. How do we know? The Naira is currently exchanged at almost 580 to the dollar. All right, so the more you see the exchange rate worsening, the more it is to tell you that our exchange rate management has not been effective and it's not working. If we're to be the flip side, then we should see some appreciation of the Naira, we should see some, some, some improvement in FX reserve and foreign receipts and all that. And don't forget, do not forget, these shortages, shortages are leading to what we call increased um, leakages in the economy. And because leakages do not exist in, the vac in vacuum, all right, they're increasing SMEs and individuals who are now engaging foreign exchange transactions, all right, in high volumes for items the central bank have banned access for, or what the central bank rolled out as um, valid for excess, uh, FX items. I don't even get what I'm trying to say. So yes, some, okay. F, some SMEs in the financial space are now funding items that are out of the, F, the central bank list to access FX. All right, so that's to tell you that with increasing policy patches and reactive solutions come severe leakages. And that comes back to hurt the foreign exchange and the value of the currency. So none of the central bank um, policies to me, I mean, talk to the layman, all right, are things cheaper, are things better? Can you exchange um, Naira to the dollar at cheaper rates? The answer is no, all right? So these things will only answer to key structural reforms. And those structural reforms must meet with the monetary policy institution aligning properly with the fiscal representation or the fiscal policy. In this context, there is a lot of divide, all right? And there's no, um, how will I put it now, uh, complementary engagement between those two parties. And don't forget, the fiscal arm is, is threatened, is, is, how will I put it, currently engages the economy under the lens of political correctness. That means what is priority for the economy within the lens of winning an election in 2023. So that already puts us in a very severe situation. All right, same conversation you have with the floating of the currency. All of these things will happen. It's not a conversation of if, it's a conversation of when. All right, and, and, and that's, that's the case. Um, um, it, it's quite bad to, to be very honest in, in the mid to long term for the Nigerian economy. All right, uh, we still have um, Gospel Obele at The Economist on the show, and we are looking at um, the federal government and the CBN um, FX and regime and management uh, in the country in a moment to return uh, with more to join us again. All right, welcome back. It's still Business Insight and Plus TV Africa. We still have Gospel Obele standing by. He joined us um, via uh, Zoom. So, Gospel, let's talk about um, the role of um, DMBs, commercial banks in all of this. Because over time, you know, we all know that the demand for you know, for FX in the country is really very high and uh, supply side is not as much as, uh, cannot really match up with demand. But over time, we've had uh, of issues uh, where, you know, the commercial banks, uh, you know, do not exactly give out this particular, you know, FX to those who have genuine need uh, for, for them. Just uh, what role do commercial banks have to play in um, the stability of um, the FX uh, in the country? Yes, um, you're very right, JJ. Um, as it's expected, commercial banks should uh, enable the aspirations, the vision, the policies, and the engagements of the central bank. All right, in terms of that intermediary, all right, between um, the consumer side of this market, that's the expectation. All right, but it, it's I mean, surprising to know that even at that level, there are a lot of misalignments. All right, and in many cases. The central bank needs to also, sorry, the commercial banks need to also protect themselves and, um, and, and all that, all right? What do you define as legitimate needs? Where does legitimate needs start and end in the sense of things, all right? So you had the central bank making pronouncements around um, we only make efforts available to consumers who need it legitimately, all right? What does the legitimate means, all right? Then go, to, in, go into the commercial banks, you realize that different commercial banks have different ways they interpret the central bank policy. Mm. So there's a lack of policy coherence and consistency between the CBN and the commercial banks. In fact, when the central bank took out the, um, I mean, restricted um, BDC access to just commercial banks, I mean, you realize that the average BDC cannot still access effects in a commercial bank. 
all right they're not even accepted in those spaces i mean it's, it's something that they're strong for they're not even accepted or regarded as people who are valid for fx transactions in this space. so the commercial banks in as much as they're trying to protect their own interest all right and in as much as you have um, um policy misalignments and all that there are also internal control issues all right there, there are limitations around how much people can access and what people can access and why they can access them so all of this um, um structure or portfolio of issues as it were yeah. all right further hurts or redefine the exchange rate value in the parallel market because one thing it does is that it creates more artificial scarcity all right and with artificial scarcity comes um, empowering of the bdc's to determine what the exchange rate should be at their will all right i've, I've been in, in engagements where individuals are trying to exchange currencies and none of them is a bdc but they're trying to agree on a rate they can put exchange for all right it's uncalled for and you cannot really really find that anywhere in the world all right where idea. national currency has been brought down so so th th there is a huge conversation around alignment from the apex body to all of the um, other intermediaries, all right, like commercial banks, fintechs, and all that. And secondly, again, I do not think that we will be able to uptake or deal with this FX problem without effective collaboration and alignment. So the central bank has to do more in collaboration with the commercial banks, do more in collaboration with the fintechs, because the fintechs have a strategy to reach the last mile. Of course. And that is something the commercial banks do not have. In as much as commercial banks have the institutional power and resources, they do not have a last mile strategy. It's the reason why you see an average fintech reaching the, 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 a rural woman in, let's say, Kaduna, and a bank cannot get there. You know, right? You go to some, some northern state and even some southern state, you can only find one bank in three villages. All right? So these are the very deep conversation. And, and you have all that speech across financial illiteracy or right, digital illiteracy and all that conversation. So the question of a productive, a productive economy and a valuable currency is largely hinged on the level of collaborations, all right? The level of empowerment in terms of enabling non-oil export businesses, sorry, non-oil sector businesses, all right? all right? To become competitive so that they can export. When they become, when they start exporting competitively, then you can start earning effects from uh, the non-oil window. I mean, that non-oil sector holds about 93% of the Nigerian GDP. Oil sector holds relatively about 7%. So how can 7% of your GDP be raking in 80 to 95% of your foreign exchange receipts? That is a gross misalignment. All right. And that is really, really poor economics in the real sense of things. All right, uh, Gospel, before we just uh, round off, I just want to get your quick um, opinion concerning uh, the CBN at the launch of um, the 100 for 100 um, PPP. It announced plan to unveil um, a new FX bidding regime to support uh, Nigerian companies in need of Forex. How far do you think that can go? Yeah, that, that may, I mean, that may be slightly effective in terms of initial rollouts, but still, like I've mentioned, and I mean, taking a cue as well on the empower many other things there is no structural basis for that to fly mm. i didn't forget what i'm trying to say you still have an economy that's heavily dependent on imports mm -hmm. you still have an sme or or smes who are struggling with increasing cost element take for instance now close to a week they reinforce scarcity all right and do you know what that means <laughs> that means that in terms of operational and costing dynamics for doing business it's worse than it used to be. True. So all of these enablers have to be working for any central bank intervention to make sense for business. I don't even get what I'm trying to say. So yes, I do. one intervention in, any, in, in terms of economic recovery and the complexities that come around with um, globalization and a post-COVID economy, you want to think of mixing your intervention, intervention with other variables that would make or break for the success of that intervention. So we need to rethink our social intervention, be it fiscal side, be it monetary side, be it institutional policy or whatever the case may be. So the central bank 100 by 100 is, the policy makes sense, just like the INRA makes sense. But all of these initiatives or these interventions do not exist to bring the results in isolation, which is why I said that upon takeoff, mm. it may slightly bring some results. But so invariably we have to go back to the, the structural bank, issues. At, we need to do, yeah, the structural and the enabling mm issues to make them fly at the end of the day all right thank I mean, you. there is hope um like at the end of the tunnel as well all right thank, thank you, you for having me JJ. thank you so much i'm gospel yeah. we do appreciate your time thank you yeah thank you
All right, and before we go, uh, ghost boat digitization is a panacea to financial services security and order bottlenecks. Now, ghost mode is an innovation by fintechs to ensure privacy as well as solve the dual challenge of protection and security. I'll leave you with highlights of that. I am Justin Akadonia. See you again next time. In Nigeria, investors are taking positions or stakes in the country's growing tech ecosystem, internet penetration, and reaching the large unbanked population. However, fintechs have been saddled with challenges of financial inclusion, loans as well as digital security. Disruptions within Nigeria's tech space will be stirred as digital banking makes its way into the fintech community through ghost mode banking. These features help to actually help to um, customers to encrypt their transactions. So in this sense, we are actually building features that will ensure security. And above all, we are also using, we are also um, providing a strong um, security architecture that will um, protect customers' data overall. And that's one of the reasons why we are actually going to talk about um, data privacy protection and um, security. So in the sense of it, if you actually even, even uh, in, if you transfer to somebody who has a funny character or criminal character or even erroneously or you misplaced your, um, your gadget and they see that transaction, they, you are protected if you are actually use that ghost mode feed. Full digitization processes mean that customers will not only be able to conduct transactions real time, but will also get much needed support online. Yes, the CBN has been clamoring for financial inclusion. And um, I, I just say that it is actually a very challenging project because I've, I've, um, I've experienced and I've uh, been involved. Um, the reason is that the cost of actually um, bringing these people on board is um, pretty high, and um, cost of doing, cost of ensuring that the their transaction is done is pretty high. This feature allows users to transfer funds to beneficiaries or make payment without revealing their identities.